patient, aren't you? Y yes, that's right. Okay, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S-O-N or S-E-N? H-A-N-S-E-N. Okay, and you're a first-year student? Yes, I am. Study in...? Uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Uh, 2805 Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. 2805 and Hesperian. Yes, that's H-E-S-P-E-R-I-A-N. Hayward, H-A-Y-W-A-R-D. And your phone number? 734-246-55. 734-246-55. No, you got the six and the four the wrong way round. It's two, four, six, five, five. Huh? Sorry. Right. And um, when were you born? Ah, uh, the 15th of June, 1986. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 5 to 10. Good. So, what's your problem? Well, frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to... Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time and with the support of friends. However, if the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine, it can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy? Or you may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities? Yes, sometimes. At first I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed. And then... I'm so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I... Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression, if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. So do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last 12 to 20 weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? Well, at first you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well? Mm, yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week. I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counselling session. Remember... Ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counselling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to a radio program on sleep deprivation. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. With us in the studio today are Dr Peter Collins, a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Chicago, and Helen Gardner, the author of the book Deep Sleep. They've come to our studio to discuss the effects of sleep deprivation, and also give some tips to the sleep-deprived on how to deal with the problem. Welcome to the studio, Helen and Peter. Now, Peter, what are the reasons for sleep deprivation, and how can it affect our lives? Well, the research into sleep deprivation started in the late 50s and has been going on ever since. Many researchers link sleep deprivation with electricity, television and computers, which have enabled humans to work 24-7. Before electricity was invented, people's body clocks were synchronised with the sun's schedule and the average time they spent sleeping was eight to nine hours a night. By 1975, that average was down to seven hours and today one-third of us sleep less than six hours a day. This leads to a condition called chronic sleep deprivation which basically means going for extended periods of time with less sleep than your body needs. Chronic sleep deprivation can cause a variety of physical and psychological problems. At its most basic level, loss of sleep can make us more irritable and less efficient and can affect long-term memory and concentration, which can result in more accidents. According to the latest research into sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation is the main reason for 3% of plane crashes, 10% of domestic accidents, 20% of accidents at work and 45% of all traffic accidents. Research into the physical effects of chronic sleep deprivation suggests more serious and significant long-term complications. Research from my university, the University of Chicago, has shown that sleep deprivation interferes with how the human body regulates insulin and sugar metabolism, which can increase the risk of diabetes. People who are sleep-deprived have weakened immune systems and are more prone to viruses and other kinds of infections. People who don't get enough sleep have cognitive problems or difficulties processing and assimilating new information. Lack of sleep affects long-term memory and slows down such abilities as judgment and reaction times. Some researchers link sleep deprivation with obesity indicating that sleep disorders and eating disorders are often linked. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Helen, you've done a fair amount of research for your recent book on helping people deal with sleeping problems. Could you give our listeners some tips on managing their sleep? Well, if you spend several hours a night tossing and turning in bed, trying to fall asleep, 
you first have to find out how much sleep you need. To do so, you'll need to try and sleep six to nine hours a night. Set aside three days for the experiment. It's best to do it on a long weekend or a holiday to ensure it doesn't get interrupted. During the experiment, you should go to bed at the same time every night and give yourself six, seven, eight or nine hours of sleep. Then monitor the way you feel throughout the day to find out how many hours of sleep you need in order to feel your best. Once you find out how much sleep you need, you can work on improving the quality of your sleep. The main secret here is to allow yourself one or two hours to relax before going to bed. You may want to try and have a warm shower or bath before going to bed. Doing some quiet activities such as reading or filing can help some people relax. A warm drink in bed helps to induce sleepiness. Some people take up yoga or meditation to help them relax at night. Different techniques will work for different people, so it's best to experiment and find the one that suits you best. You should definitely avoid using technology before going to bed. Activities such as playing video games, watching TV and others which require you to use your attention can stop you from falling asleep. Avoid eating before going to bed. A late dinner can disrupt your sleep. Not only is going to bed with a heavy stomach bad for digestion and can make you overweight, but it can also keep you awake for hours. Caffeine-rich drinks can increase your heart rate, which can stop you from falling asleep. Energy drinks also have the same effect on your body. You should avoid drinking these at night. The same goes for vigorous physical exercise, such as weightlifting or working out on a treadmill. In many cases, you can reset your body clock and make it tick for you by changing your lifestyle. If your sleep deprivation is severe, it's always best to seek professional advice and get an appointment with your doctor, who might prescribe you sleeping pills. Thank you, Helen. We'll be back after the break and we'll be answering questions we've received from our listeners. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a woman calling Laverton Arts Centre for some information. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Laverton Arts Centre, how can I help you? Hello. I've been to the Arts Centre a few times recently and I understand you have this scheme for regular visitors. The Friends of Laverton Arts Centre? Yes, that's right. I wonder if you could tell me a little about it. I mean, how much it costs and what benefits it offers, things like that. Certainly. Well, first of all, the good news is that we've recently changed the scheme. It used to cost £15 a year, but now it's free. 
all you have to do is fill in an application form. You can either come to the Arts Centre and do that here, or you can go to our website and apply online. And so what are the benefits of joining? There are actually quite a few. As a friend of Laberton Arts Centre, you'll receive a newsletter every three months with information on all the forthcoming events. That sounds useful. You also get priority booking for shows and concerts in the main theatre. Can you explain how that works exactly? Yes. What that means is that when tickets go on sale, for the first two days they're only available to friends of the Arts Centre. So as long as you book early, you can make sure you get seats. Great. Do you ever offer discounts to friends of the centre? Under the old system, when you had to pay to be a member, we did. Under the new system, there won't be any discounts for shows in the main theatre or films at the art cinema. Having said that, we will be offering some discounts to members for performances in the small theatre. There'll be information about this in each issue of the newsletter. I suppose I can find that information online as well, can I? Absolutely. Actually, we're redoing our website at the moment. Right now, there actually isn't a special section for Friends of the Arts Centre on the website. Once the site's been redesigned, there will be. You'll be able to put in your username and password and enter a special section just for you. It sounds excellent. Are there any requirements, though? I mean, as a member, do I have to do anything? Yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. There are no formal requirements at all, though obviously we have this scheme to encourage people to attend events here regularly. So we ask that you attend at least four events a year, whatever they are, if you possibly can. Nobody's going to count, though, and it's totally up to you. That sounds fair enough. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. While you're here, we're actually conducting a short survey of people who phone up the Arts Centre. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? It'll only take a couple of minutes. Sure, no problem. Thanks a lot. So, how many times have you visited Laverton Arts Centre in the last six months? Well, I've only lived in the area for the last four months, so not that many times. Um, three, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Fine. And how did you first find out about the Arts Centre? Let me think. Oh, yes, a friend invited me to a concert and I came with her. Have you ever seen a film at the Arts Cinema here? No, I haven't, to be honest. In fact, until you mentioned it earlier, I didn't realise you even had a cinema. One more question. If we offered a free tour of the Arts Centre, including things such as going backstage to look at the dressing rooms, would you be interested in going on it? Oh, yes, definitely. I think a tour like that would be very interesting. I'd even pay for it. That's great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on two famous American presidents. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln lived in different times and had very different family and educational backgrounds. Kennedy lived in the 20th century, while Lincoln lived in the 19th century. Kennedy was born in 1917, whereas Lincoln was born more than 100 years earlier, in 1809. As for their family backgrounds, Kennedy came from a rich family, but Lincoln's family was not wealthy. Because Kennedy came from a wealthy family, he was able to attend expensive private schools. He graduated from Harvard University. Lincoln, on the other hand, had only one year of formal schooling. In spite of his lack of normal schooling, he became a well-known lawyer. He taught himself law by reading law books. Lincoln was, in other words, a self-educated man. In spite of these differences in Kennedy and Lincoln's backgrounds, some interesting similarities between the two men are evident. In fact, many books have been written about the strange coincidences in the lives of these two men. For example, take their political careers. Lincoln began his political career as a U.S. congressman. Similarly, Kennedy also began his political career as a congressman. Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1847. Kennedy was elected to the House in 1947. They went to the Congress just 100 years apart. Another interesting coincidence is that each man was elected President of the United States in a year ending with the number 6-0. Lincoln was elected President in 1860 and Kennedy was elected in 1960. Furthermore, both men were president during years of civil unrest in the country. Lincoln was president during the American Civil War. During Kennedy's term of office, civil unrest took the form of civil rights demonstrations. Another striking similarity between the two men was that, as you probably know, neither lived to complete his term in office. Lincoln and Kennedy were both assassinated while in office. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, after only 1,000 days in office. Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, a few days after the end of the American Civil War. It's rather curious to note that both presidents were shot while they were sitting next to their wives. These are only a few examples of the uncanny and unusual similarities between the destinies of these two American men, who had a tremendous impact on the social and political life of the United States and the imagination of the American people. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.